Okay, I, w I will just stay away from that. Um, so I think this is the, the last session probably, isn't it? The last, the, uh, um, there is a lab afterwards, but as far as the lectures go, this is the last one, I think. Uh, so everyone must be pretty tired, but I guess also everyone is uh, interested to learn about deep learning. Yeah, good. Um, do we have the recording, Shira? Is it recording? Great. Um, so I'm sure many of you have, or most of you, have uh, heard about deep learning. And uh, here I'm just going to give kind of a gentle introduction, but uh, feel free to, to raise your hand during the talk and ask me questions, and we, we will uh, discuss them together. Ah, that would be awesome, yeah. Yes, thanks. So this is the Google Trends for, um, it shows how often the keyword deep learning, machine learning, data science have been searched in Google uh, for the last 13 years. And uh, you can see that as expected, machine learning and data science have kind of an upwards trend. Um, and the same is true for deep learning. So you can see that deep learning is something that has been queried in Google, you know, uh, almost as often as data science, so it's something very popular. And uh, just to give the motivation, let me start with like a little quiz. Uh, I'm going to show you like this, two rows of symbols. It's the row up and the row down. And I'm going to show it very, very quickly. And I want to ask you afterwards which row it's easier for you to memorize. So let's go. So if I ask you to, to, to write down the symbols, the three symbols from the first or the second row, which one is easier? The first one. You even rem remember it, right? Why is that? Why, why it's easier? It's numbers. It's something that, that, that you already know, basically, right? So what about this? Which one is easier now? Which one is easier? Who says the first row? Okay, who says the second? Okay, it's, it's, I think most, most people say that the first one is easier to memorize. And I think the answer for that is because it's still something that we can recognize. So here I have combination of numbers. I try to make it more complicated. But still, this is like an upside down seven. And this is like a mirrored four. So. So still, this is you know, more ink on the top than on the bottom. But uh, this is symbols that you have never seen again. So what I want to motivate is that when, when you do deep learning, you want to learn um, by composing simple things. So um, you, you get the learning task, which is here, for example, to, to, to understand what, what this represents. And you decompose in something simpler. And in, in this case, the simplest thing is the digits, and then you use this to build your uh, representation of, of the new um, input that I'm giving you, right? Um, so that's the motivation. In, if you take this many steps further and many layers deeper to start using terminology, then you can learn really complicated things. So you get something like a scene, um, you do self-driving cars, for example, and then you decompose it more and more and more and more until you reach something that is easy to learn, like the digits, and then you build up, 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 combining all these concepts, and then you get something really complicated. And so this is how people represent neural networks. Uh, imagine that here, for example, you have some inputs and some outputs. The inputs could be uh, something like time of the day um, at different times. And the outputs could be the measurement of temperature and humidity or something. Temperature and humidity. So the, the motivation now is that instead of going from inputs to outputs directly by doing regression or something like that, you have one more layer, which you call the hidden layer. 
So what's happening? Instead of learning a function that goes from input to output, I learn a function that goes from input to something and from something to output. Now this is what's going to encourage this composite learning. So I'm going to learn this something to be something simpler than the, the, than the input. And I'm going to use that to build the output. So it's, it's kind of a way of doing the composition. OK? Probably you have seen all this stuff already. And uh, there is one funny thing called connectionism. Uh, there is some um, group of people, I guess, some people that claim that uh, deep learning is motivated by how the brain works, and uh, hence neural networks come from the neural networks in your brain. Um, I think probably actually that's not entirely true. It's like a, a, a very uh, strong simplification, and I don't think anyone knows how the brain works. But having said that, uh, you can see examples of deep learning or composite learning in the parts of the brain that we do understand. For example, when you, in the, in the, in the cortex, in the, uh, in the front, it's uh, the, the part of the brain that's responsible for visual understanding, and we know that there is some sort of hierarchical learning. So there is some identifies, identified areas of the brain, which we know that the retina in the eye, for example, is uh, responsible for capturing the equivalent of pixels, in, now that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing you. And then uh, you kind of identify edges, like little corners, all this desk that I'm seeing here. Um, and then you have primitive shape detectors, so it's like rectangles, triangles, this kind of stuff. And then you have higher level visual abstractions, so I can say, oh, okay, this is a desk, this is a human, and so on. Uh, so researchers from neuroscience have, pr have shown that, and this is one of the motivations as well for doing this in the computer. Um, so now I, I thought I could show you some applications, but I want to point out that Mustafa in the next session is going to show you the really cool stuff actually because you will be able to run them. Um, oh, before I go there, um, I don't want to distract you, but I will, I will show you a notebook in a, in a little bit which you can also interact with. It's very, very simple. Um, perhaps it's worth trying to follow the usual path to get the notebook, so uh, you connect to DSA 2017, and then you go to uh, the deep learning tutorial. You either download and run the notebook yourselves, or you can run it through the server with, uh, as, as we did in the previous classes. Um, I, I'm not going to use it now, now, but just you know, for you to keep trying, but, but don't, don't be very distracted, okay? So, um, yeah, some applications. Um, just here is, is a bunch of websites, actually, because it's so, uh, so popular, deep learning. There's a bunch of websites that have, you know, uh, they have collected some cool applications. So he, let me show you some applications here. For example, you can use deep learning to color um, images, black and white images. So you see, uh, the, you train an algorithm, and then you present images um, that the model has, has never seen before, and the model is going to give color to these images. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Um, then there is applications where you add sounds to silent movies, machine translation. Um, this is what Ralph showed as well. Uh, this is a particular example where I think not only they translate, but they also superimpose it in the picture. So you can go from more chocolate, I don't know what language it is, to dark chocolate, and you can actually produce the, the, the new image. Um, object classification, uh, you can have uh, multi-label classification, uh, automatic hand handwritten um, uh, passages generation, so these things have been actually generated by a machine. Um, you have machines that uh, they cite Shakespeare and they write new poems or whatever. <laughs> Um, automatic caption generation. So, so this is a thing from DeepMind um, uh, for reinforcement learning. It's also using neural networks. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. So one particularly nice from here, I think. Um, let's see if I have enough in hand to show it to you. Uh, changing guesses of people in photos. <laughs> so that's all artificially generated. Um, yeah, so you can do all this stuff. Uh, let me go back to the presentation. 
hopefully by now some of you might have connected already and got, in, and got the notebook. Oops. Okay. So, so um, in this lecture, I want to give you the basics of deep learning and of training neural networks. And I want to stress that actually it's much simpler than probably you might think. It's, it's, it's really simple stuff. So once it's, it's all the channel, once you understand that, then it's really, really easy to build up from there and, and really master deep learning. And I, I, I promise you, it's, it's as simple as that. Of course, there is a lot of state-of-the-art and, and new algorithms, but if you understand the basics, it's, it's really, really important. So I will start with the math here, but, and I promise it's not going to be anything very complicated. Um, and I will start with um, a one-layer model, so not even a deep learning. It's like shallow learning. I will start with logistic regression. How many people know logistic regression? Okay. So to explain what happens in logistic regression, you have some inputs and some outputs. The inputs I call x, the outputs I call y, and you have some activation. The activation is a function that maps inputs to outputs. And um, well, in this case, what I do, I just multiply the inputs by, by a parameter. So I get my inputs, I multiply them by w, a parameter, and then I apply this function, which is a nonlinear function. And that's what I show you in this graph. The activation in this graph is, uh, is called like the sigma -width function, and it's mapping inputs to, let's say, uh, outputs between 0 and 1. So if I get the input here, the output is something slightly bigger than 0. If I get in the middle, it's 0 0.5. If I get it here, it's 1. And if I have a different function, like with different parameters, so this is from minus 10 to 10, this is from minus 20 to 20, it's the same. It's guaranteed to give you something between 0 and 1. So the thought is that you can use that for classification, right? You can say that uh, everything that, that falls uh, in this area here, it's negative class, and everything that falls here is positive class. So 0 0.5 is kind of your threshold, right? And, um, and this is true for any input, because remember, any input will go between 0 and 1 necessarily. Now, what do, you, what do you learn there? You learn this w, right? So you get your input, you multiply by w, and then you pass it through this function. And this w is something that you learn, and you learn it so that it fits your data. So it's like uh, a linear fit, basically, right? Everyone knows that. And um, I'm going to show you uh, in the notebook how this works on this very simple data. So this is my input, it's three dimensions, and my output is zero or one, and I want to train uh, a logistic regression. So have you managed to get to the notebook? I can show it anyway, and you can play with it afterwards. It's not super crucial to do it alone, but um, do you have any difficulties? How, how many have managed to run it? Okay, a few people, it's okay. I'm going to show it in the screen anyway. Um, okay, well, before I go to the screen, let me show you this. Um, the, the outputs are what I call Y, and now I have to define a loss. So the loss is, I say that, is the difference of what I predict, which is F, minus what should really be there and then I just square it so that the order doesn't matter. F is what I predict, right? It's, it's here. This phi is this, sigmo is this sigmoid activation that we were plotting before. X is your input, W is your parameters. So all this thing goes here. That's what you predict for input X. And then you, know, you apply it to your data and you say, OK, I'm, going to pr I'm predicting 0 0.7, but it should be 1. And for the other data point, I'm, I'm predicting 0 0.1, but it should be 0. And then by doing this many, many times iteratively, you can adjust the W to fit your data, OK? And when I say you adjust, what you do, basically, you just, you just find the derivative, right? That's how you optimize. So the derivative in this case, uh, well, it's simple, right? So we will see it before, but it looks like that. OK, so here's the notebook. Can you all see it, or is it too small? Is it fine? OK, shout if it's not fine. So 
So I'm going to run it from the beginning. This is just some helper functions, just run them, don't worry about that. This activation is what implements the, sig the sigmoid function that I was showing before. It guarantees that for, for every input, the output is going to be between 0 and 1. And here I also implement the derivative, because that's what we're going to use to learn the parameters. So it's fine. I plot my function just to make sure that uh, is what I, I think it is. Basically, it's what I was showing you before, right? That's exactly what I showed you before, but I have it in a notebook so we can interact and play with the code. Um, here I also plot the, the derivative. So you see the derivative goes up and then down, which is because it, it's representing the, the, uh, the rate of change of the function. And this is the, the actual stuff. So here x and y is what I had before in my little table, is my data. x is the inputs, y is the outputs. And this is the code that is doing logistic regression, right? So just with this lens of code, you can build your own classifier. And uh, this classifier is basically like, the fir like a single layer neural network. So this w is the weight that I was showing you before. And well, what I want to show here is that you do what is called the forward pass and the backward pass. So the forward pass, you, if, if you remember, right, you have to predict this f and then see how far it is from your y. So the forward pass is just predicting your f from your given data, from your input data. So th it's, this is exactly what I'm showing you before with math. So f is what I predict if my, if my input is x, f0, which is x. And then what you do is that you take the gradient and you adjust. You say, OK, I, what I predict is, too, is, is wrong in this direction or that direction. The direction is given by the derivative. So it's, it's exactly this. I just built it in three steps. And then um, what you need to do is that you say, OK, um, what would be a good update rule if I have some parameter and I need to change it? Um, how do I change it? I start from the current parameter and then I add something, right? So if my parameter is like 10 and this is giving me something that is very wrong, then I have to add something to, to this parameter and get some other parameter. And how big this something is has to do with how wrong I was in the first place, right? So this is what uh, the derivative is saying. And uh, we also have this learning rate here for convenience. So the learning rate is going to tell you how much big step to take, how much you move away from the current value, OK? Um, so let me write and see what we get. OK, so what I plot here, here on the x-axis I have a number of iterations. That's super simple. So 2,000 times I predicted a value, and then I saw how wrong it is, and I updated my parameters. And then I did the same again, and again, and again, and again, 2,000 times. And on the y-axis, I get the error, how, how the error has decreased. And you see it's a nice, nice trend that goes uh, down like that, meaning that I'm, I'm doing the correct thing. The error is reduced more and more. D does anyone have an idea why I start from around 0 0.5? Any guess? 0.5 is the, we said, is the decision boundary. So 0 is like not, not uh, my class, 1 is my class. So 0 0.5 is something like in between, right? So it's when you are uncertain about something. Let's say you do classification of, um, of, of, of some objects, of, of cuts or something, and you want to, the output to be, to be 1 if it's a cut and 0 if it's not. So before you see any data in the beginning, before you do training, it's 0 0.5 because it doesn't know if it's 0 or 1. So it just gives something roughly in the middle, right? Is it clear? Good. Um, and basically, we just, we just train a, a one-layer neural network now. That was it. OK, so we just train a one-layer neural network. Because if you, if you think that your deep learning model is just one layer, that's basically all it's happening, right? And now uh, let's go deeper. Um, 
Now I'm, I'm really stressed about the colors after uh, Athanasius talk yesterday. I don't know if yellow and blue go well, probably not. <laughs> I had another pass in my slides, I was very stressed. So what we showed before was logistic regression, right? Now I show it in a different form uh, as, as a diagram so that eventually we are going to build the, the neural network. So I have some inputs X and my output is what I call F. And I said that F is like this nonlinear activation which has as input the parameters times the inputs, right? So that's what I did before. So now to build a neural network, you just do this twice. So that's what you do. So now this is kind of a deep network. Deep meaning it just has depth two. So you have your input, and the first layer is exactly the same, but you say that, okay, you know, um, I'm not happy with one layer. When I, pre when I do prediction, I want to take this prediction and put it in another activation again. So this will force to do this composite learning that we showed in the beginning, right? So now this has more power. Is it clear? So I get, if you see, this is, this is the, the important part. So this is exactly the same as before. So from x, what I predict is phi, which has arguments w times x, and I call this f1. And here, my prediction now is phi w times f1. So the input of this function is the output of that function. You understand how, how, how it's, it's being built now, right? So you have one function that takes some input and some output, and you say this output is not my final output, but I'm going to give it as input to some other function. And that's what deep learning does. And you can treat it in exactly the same way. So here's exactly what I showed before. And this is the, the loss of the logistic regression. You say that's my optimization objective. So I, I did 2,000 iterations before, and I used this to calibrate my model. I say my f, well, I want it to be very close to y, and I, I took the derivative. So here, you do the same. So the loss is the same, and then this is your activation, but now your activation, so that, that, that's, that's, that's a kind, of, kind of an important slide, and it's not as complicated as it looks. So my, my, my output is, is, is the same as before, but instead of having x, I have a, the same thing again. It's like a nested thing. It's like a recursive thing. So my, my input here, instead of being x, is something that has the same form, right? So it's like a nested thing. It's like a loop. And, um, and then now I have two sets of weights. Why? Because I have two layers. So now I have two layers in my network. So to calibrate it, I need the derivative with respect to w0 and with respect to w1. Okay, and um, I can show it to you here. Again, it looks scary, but it's not at all scary because it's, it's, it's just the application of the chain rule. So this is, I want to find the derivative of this objective function with respect to w1. And now I do it step by step very analytically, right? So first, the two comes here, things cancel out. Right? And then you take, because W1 appears inside F2, you do the chain rule here. Okay? And now F2, what is F2? F2 is actually phi of F1 times W1. And I, I do another chain rule here. Right? Because um, uh, W1 appears here. So it's another chain rule. And then I'm done. Right? I just write it like this. Okay, so it's just chain rule, even if you cannot fully uh, like parse it. And this is what happens for the other way. So this is for W1. So let me just write something on the board to make it a bit clearer what I have here. So that's what I have, right? I have some inputs x, right? And then x, basically, I have some function here that says um, I'm going to f1, which is phi of x times w0. And now this f1 is going to f2, which is what? Is phi of f1, oops, yeah times w1, okay? So if I want, 
this F1 here, I can replace it with this. Okay? And then when I want to take the derivative of the loss, so I want the derivative of this with respect to W to W0, right? So W0 appears here, which appears here, which appears here. So that's how the chain rule happens again and again. So that's exactly why we say that in a to train a neural network, you need to apply the chain rule many, many, many times. So if, if I had a thousand layers here, then I would just need to do this a thousand times. Because what happens is that, is that here, th this is exactly the same as before, but because the derivative here is not with W0, but with, the, uh, sorry, not W1, but W0, I have to do the chain rule once again because I have this nested thing, right, where one function is assigned some other function. So I have to, do, to add, basically, that's the only thing that I added is the red terms here. So if I have one more layer, I would have this one more time, and so on, right? So you can have a neural network and you just re repeat this operation many, many times, and that's how you get the derivative, and then you can train the, uh, the neural network, okay? So let's see this again in the notebook. So this is the deep neural network. It, the code seems very similar to before, so that's my data. And this is the code. So I don't know if you guys had the impression that neural networks and deep learning is hard, but basically with this code, it's all I need to learn to train two layers, a, a, a deep neural network, basically. It's, that's, that's all the code you need. So you say that I initialize my weights, the W0 and the W1, um, it's, that's my parameters. And then you do the forward pass, because, the for, because what you need to do is that you need to predict something, and then you get the error, and then you see how wrong you were. That's what the error is doing. So to know how wrong you are, first you have to predict. And that's the forward pass. You give the inputs to one function. So, so you give your inputs f0, which is x, to one function. And then this function goes to the other function. Right? If I had 1,000 layers, I would do the same. I would put f2 in the next function. I would do this thing. Right? I would write 1,000 lines of that, or I would do a for loop. And then I would have like 1,000 layers. That, that's all. That, that's what it is. So that's my forward pass. My x goes in one function and then in another function, two layers down, and that's my prediction. And then I want to see how wrong I am in the prediction. What I do, I go here and I, up and I update according to the derivative. So I say that my w0 parameter is, I, I, is what it was before, and I add the gradient times the learning rate. Right? So, what's the gradient? Well, the gradient is what I show in the board, which is implemented here. So, it's something very small. Right? I do the same with W1, and I do this 10,000 times. Right? So, I predict the outputs through two layers, and then backward pass, I find the error, and I take the gradients, and I do the chain rule. It's exactly what, what, I, what I showed before. And that's it. And I will run it, and it runs very fast. And that's the result I guess I, I get. Again, in the x-axis is the number of, of iterations, how many times I predict it and correct it, predict it and correct it. I did it 10,000 times. And this is the error. So the, again, it starts from 0 0.5, because initially uh, it's a stupid model. It doesn't know if I have to predict 0 or 1. So it's just predicting something in the, in the, in the, in the mid. And then as I go, as I do more and more iterations, the error becomes smaller and smaller. Okay? Is it clear? And, well, that's basically, if you see this notebook, this code, that's pretty much it. You can go and implement your neural network. And um, I put some homework from you, for you. I think it's going to be uh, useful to do these exercises. So one would be to extend for arbitrary depth. So now I have two layers. Try to do it for like 10 layers and see if you can use a for loop. Okay? So you will need to repeat basically these operations and maybe you need to consult the maths which are in the slides 
So this red term that I had that repeats, you just add more and more of those. Um, you can add bias in the activation. I think if you read the literature, you understand what this means. And you can play with different parameters. For example, you can change the learning rate here. I will explain what this is. And well, one thing you can do is just forget about this notebook and try to re-implement it, okay? Because you see it's not something very difficult. If you do that, you will have a very good basis to use deep learning methods. Um, let me focus a little bit on the learning rate. So the learning rate says how much I want to correct. So let's say that you drive on the road and there is like a person or a cow in front of you and you want to turn the wheel. But how much do you turn it, right? To correct, of course you turn it as much to not hit the person, but you, you don't want to turn it too little because then you might hit the person. If you turn it too much, then you go in some other wrong direction, right? So the learning rate is telling you how much to correct, basically. Um, let's see what happens if I, if I put something very small. What will think, how, how will you think this line will, will, uh, will be now? So I will run it now, and the learning rate is something very, very small. So in every iteration, I do a very small, a very, very small correction. So I want to go from a very bad result to the very good result where my error is almost zero, but now I do very small corrections. Who can tell me how, the line, how this line will look like? Take a shot. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to take a long time, right? Let's, let's, write, let's run it. So we'll run it again for the same number of iterations. You see, from 0 0.5, it went to 0 0.49, right? So, if I, if, so instead of 10,000 iterations, I should do something like 100,000, right? Well, now it's, it's running. <laughs> you see? And it did, it did something a bit more now, right? So I have to run it for many, 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 many iterations. So I don't want a very small learning rate because I will have to wait forever. What happens if I put a, a very big learning rate? I will put something like 200, something crazy. That's a more difficult question. But imagine the, the example with a cow and the car. What will happen if you want to correct something and you correct too much? Take a shot. I don't have t-shirts to give you, but you can still give me the answer. <laughs> okay, let's run it and see what will happen. Well, what's happening is that nothing, nothing is changing. The error is 0 0.5, so the error go goes nowhere. Why does that happen since I try to correct very much? Well, the answer is because I overcorrect, right? So imagine that you are driving and you want to st steer the wheel and you steer it so much that you end up going in circles, right? Um, or in, in a, basically in every iteration you, you mess up your parameters more than what you fix them because you overcorrect. So have a shot at that. Try to play with these things, with the learning rate and all these things. The notebook is there. Okay, that's the original curve. Um, is it clear? What I just showed, that was, feel free to make me questions. That, that was the most technical part, but I think it's very important to understand at least the concept. Any mm -hmm. questions so far? Are you running the notebook? Okay, I have a question, yes. What is the difference between deep learning and machine learning? Okay, so the question is, what is the difference between deep learning and machine learning? Um, I have a slide for that. Can I, can I answer that in the end? Is it okay? Or are you impatient? <laughs> I, 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 can, I can just say that deep learning is like a, a subcategory of machine learning, right? So in deep learning, you are focused on, on models that are deep, on models that, are, that have more than one layers, that, that have this structure of neural networks that I showed you, okay? So for example, I showed logistic regression here that's not a deep model, right? So you wouldn't call this deep learning, but this is still a, a probabilistic model, so it's machine learning, right? Other questions? Okay, one more question, yeah. What's the difference between 
neural, neural networks mm -hmm. and deep neural networks? Ah, okay, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe I didn't make it very clear. What's the difference between neural networks and deep neural networks? Well, originally, people uh, talked about um, something that was called the Persetron, which is like a neural network that was relatively shallow, and then I think it's just a, a matter of semantics. People want to emphasize that these things have really many layers, because finally we have big machines to run them, so it's just deep neural network. But I don't think there is any real difference, to be honest. I don't know if there is any other opinion in this room. It's just, it's just semantics. OK, um, I'll take more questions in the end, obviously. So um, what I'm showing here is some frameworks that allow you to make, to, to, to do deep learning much more easily. So I gave you the notebook. Of course, you don't expect to go and and put it like in a, a pro in production system, right? And, uh, and put in self-driving cars and running the code from my notebook, right? I, you wouldn't trust that. I wouldn't trust that either. Um, but you understood the basics, and you see that you have to, uh, to do this chain rule, find this gradient and so on. So you can do it yourself, but it's a little bit boring maybe, tiring. So there is, because a chain rule, when you do the chain rule, right, this is just a recipe. How, how do I know how to make the gradients? And I say, oh, you do that, then you do the chain rule. That's just a recipe, right? You find a maths book and it's just telling you how to do it. Well, you can teach the recipe to a machine and the machine can do all these gradients for you. And also can do many other stuff. So there is frameworks like PyTorch, which is the one we're going to use in a little while with uh, Mustafa, uh, that allow you to build this kind of uh, powerful deep learning models without having to sweat too much. There is other frameworks like MXNet, and there is, well, there is plenty. I didn't want to put too many of those because I didn't want to forget something and then uh, create some political problem. Um, but yeah, there is many frameworks. So in a little while, you will play with PyTorch and you will see how it works. Um, so I want to talk about one thing now, uh, which is called overfitting. Have you heard about this term? Let me show you here an example. This is my training data, whatever it is, right? Uh, X and Y, and I plot them, these little Xs, okay? And then I want to do again a fit, okay? I want to fit a line, you have seen it in previous lectures. And I did it in two ways. I have the blue and the red. The blue is the one in the middle if you're colorblind, and the red is the one on the left. So the question here is, wh which one is a better model for the training data that I have? Who thinks is the who thinks is the middle, the blue? No one. Who thinks is the red? Okay, everyone thinks the red is better. Can someone tell me why? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, that was that. Yeah, that's a very good answer. So you want to generalize, meaning that you want this to be valid for things that are not in your training set, right? So this guy here tried too hard to capture all the training points. So he was going like this, like, oh, I have to also get this. So it's passing, it is basically, it's, it's perfectly explaining your training data, right? So it's, it's perfect for your training data. This one is not perfect for your training data because this is not explained by the curve. So if, do you remember how we trained this model? We took the prediction and we saw how far it is from the real value. So the prediction here in minus 1.5, what is it? You go up. Is, is here, right, 4.3 or something, the prediction. And the true value is 5.3 or something. So there is a very big error there. So with a recipe that I showed you before, if you run it like forever, it will try to correct all these errors because no one told the machine anything about generalization, right? The machine just says, I have to make the error as small as possible. Now imagine that you take like a neural network, which is like, you know, like an overkill, right? like a bazooka, and you, you apply it to your problem, you have 10 layers. So this can, can basically learn any function, right? So if you, don't, if, if, you, if you don't handle it with care, then it's going to come in this, in this scenario here, right? So it's like, it's like a, a dangerous weapon, which you handle, but you handle with care somehow. And uh, a lot, a, a lot uh, on deep learning, a lot of research in deep learning is actually how to make these things um, avoid this scenario. 
Okay? Good. Um, so that's the basics of deep learning, and um, I I want to say well, I have some, I have some more slides. Well, how, how much time do we have? It was one and a half hour, right? But I should have plenty, no? Relatively speaking. Okay. <laughs> um, so n n now we saw like how to train neural network. We even discussed that you can do part of that automatically, right? So what was the whole fuss about deep learning? Why there is so many conferences? Well, because I showed you the basic architecture, and there is plenty of other things you can do to, to, to further progress it, to further adapt it to your problems. Um, so, for example, in this, in here what you can do is that you can say, instead of having this file being this sig like, like S function, it could be some other function. Or you could wire this thing differently, or you could train it in a different way, right? You could add some regularizer. So it's, it's, it's a lot about that. And um, there is various techniques uh, to, to, ma to make it, um, to, to, to do all these things. Uh, let me ask you one thing. Um, what would be a really, really simple way to avoid this situation? If, even in the notebook that I showed you, right? In the code that I showed you, if you run it like many, many times, it will try to with many layers, it will try to correct all the little errors, right? Because that's what I, I asked the machine to do. So it will correct this error, so it will, it will do something like that, right? So what is a very, very simple way that I can avoid this? Can anyone tell me? So if I run, if I run this many, many times, at some point it will start correcting all the little errors, right? And I don't want that. I want at some point to, 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 to be satisfied. So if I show you the code, what, which line would you change? I run it for like 100,000 iterations, right? I could run it for fewer iterations. It's a very simple trick, right? So it's called early stopping. So what you do is that you learn, but you don't learn too much. So, and you hope that you stop before you start doing these things here. Okay. Um, so let's see this in practice. So if you, if you go to playground.tensorflow.org um, This is basically a website that allows you to play with neural networks in real time. Which is pretty cool. Um, so what's happening here is that I have some data and I can select what data I want. I can, I can have my data to be this. It's classification. And two colors represent two different classes. Uh, in, so in this example, um, my data, one class is like a ball inside, and the other class is like a circle outside. This is my inputs, x and y axis. And now what I can do is I, I can construct a neural network just by with a mouse, right? So I can say how many, how many neurons I want, or even how many layers I want. So what I, what I showed you before, what to implement it in the, in the notebook, what to implement it is something like that, right? I had put four neurons, and I had put like one, like two outputs here, right? And that's what we implemented before. And I can press play, and actually you are going to see here how this is being learned. So you see that in every iteration, the network is learning something. And here you see how strong are these connections. So that's exactly what we did before, but now we, we, we visualize it. OK? Does everyone understand what, what this is showing? And then you can do like more crazy stuff. So you can add like many layers. You make the network more powerful. So what do you think now will happen? Now I have many, many parameters, right? I'm going to run it for a little bit. What do you think will happen? It's, it's going to train as well. Let me do it even more. Let's see. Well, now it's training, but it's not as good as before. Ah, I got there. OK, it took a little bit more time though, right? And why, why did that happen? I have more 
more parameters now, right? So it takes more time to train them. So every single box of those represents these W's that we want to optimize. When you did a chain rule with two sets of W's before, we had two of these, but now we have all of those. So we have many parameters, and with many parameters you need more time. But eventually, for this simple problem, it works. So you can have a go and play with that as well. And back to my presentation. Okay. So uh, if you take some papers from the uh, deep learning community, you will see people draw stuff like this or stuff like this. Oops, no, spoiler, spoiler. Okay, or stuff like this. Um, so this is really crazy neural networks. They have many layers and they do a lot of tricks in between. Look at this. Uh, Inception is used for speech, vision. Everything is vision. Okay, so this is the speech as well. Okay, so people use this neural network to classify any image. So I think there is an API on the internet. You can just take your camera and take photos, and it will tell you this is a dog, this is a bottle, and so on. And and basically, it's this neural network, right? But if you see this neural network, this is like one layer, two, three, four, and so on. If you just see just a slice here, a very, a very small part of that is exactly what we explained. And then to make it bigger, you just, you just add more, right? Just um, add more terms, but that's, that's pretty much it. So the beauty of, 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 of the deep neural network is that is what is called end-to-end -end differentiable which means that you can write this whole beast here, and then you say, I want to train it. And then you, want, you can find the derivative of the output, which is here, with respect to the input, to, to some of the parameters, which is there. Because you have this chain that gets bigger, 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 it forms like a chain, right? And actually, with the software that you're going to use later with the, in the lab, you're going to see that this is actually much even easier than the notebook that I showed you. You just declare how many of those you want and then you just press fire and stuff happen. Um, okay, so now I want to uh, discuss about some specific cases. So we talk about classifications and neural networks, but the real power of neural networks, at least how it has been demonstrated so far, is in applications in uh, images and applications in speech, and particularly in images. If you see like the, what I had before uh, about uh, the 30 most awesome deep learning things. A lot of, a lot of that, uh, at least, is in images. Um, so image classification. That's fun things people have tried. They tried to classify a labra, lab, labradoodle from fried chicken. That's actually not very easy. I, th I bet even you can make some mistakes in some of those. Then you have puppy or bagel. Some are li really similar, right? Then you have sheepdog or a mop. <laughs> this is a dog. It took me some time. Then you have chihuahua or muffin. That's also difficult. Barn owl or apple. Parrot or guacamole. <laughs> That's the most difficult, I think. Someone made this. <laughs> That's also difficult, I think. <laughs> okay, people are taking photos, so I'm going to switch quickly. So that's binary classification. Um, and you can take this many steps forward. So this is the uh, image recognition platform in AWS, and it allows you to do much more advanced things. So here, for example, you can give like an image, and you can have labeling and accuracy. Remember Ralph's talk that we really need the probabilities, right? So you can get annotations like this. For example, here is a rock with some percent of confidence. This is a person, mountain bike, outdoors. So you can start composing these things and say that instead of doing binary classification, I want to do more and more complex things, right? And that's this composition of adding more and more elements and uh, training pretty much the same way how you get to this amazing and cool results that we, we saw in the very beginning of the talk. 
Okay. Um, so one of the very big success stories in deep learning and basically probably the main thing that is used for images is what is called the convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network is like a regular neural network, but it has some extra tricks. Um, so do you remember, do you remember Neil's talk? Uh, well, that was two days ago. He was saying, you want to classify me as a human, right? And now you know I'm a human, and now I'm still a human, right? And now I'm still a human, and now I'm still a human. So one of the big challenges is how to be able to understand objects in pictures when these objects appear in, in different places. So the convolutional neural network is very much similar to a neural network as that it has layers and is trained with some form of back propagation, but it has this convolution operator. So you can see it here, how it works. So in one of the steps, you don't have to fully understand that, but just because it's something that is very popular and I'm sure you have heard about that. So you have something that's called like filter that, is some, that, that, that you learn and you pass it in the image and you create something that's called a feature map. So this filter is interacting with the window on which it's being applied and it's generating something which is called a feature map and this is something that you use to learn. And there is something else which I, I don't have time to explain uh, which is called the pooling operator uh, that's combining all these things. And the bottom line of the story is that one of the cool things you can do with convolutional neural networks is to, to understand scenes and to understand objects in scenes, even if these things are like in the corners, in, in different places, all over the place. So I can have a training set which has uh, images that appear, let's say, in, uh, with objects appearing in, in ram random positions, and then I can show a picture with the specific object I want to classify appearing in a particular corner and it will still find it, even if it was not the same position the training set. And just to understand uh, the concept of the power of these things when you start combining them, what's happening is that, uh, you remember in the very beginning we said that the way you train a neural network is by learning, by training something complex and then b having all these layers that learn simplicity and then they combine simplicity. So if you visualize uh, these, these, these weights, that, that these, these parameters that, that we were dealing with before in the, in the convolutional neural network, then you will see that it's, it will learn something very simple in the first layer. So what is this? This is kind of like, like orientation, right? It learns like basic orientations. And then the next layer is going to kind of combine these things to learn something more more interesting. So from these things that is like, they don't, it doesn't, they don't understand the shapes or anything. They're like, oh, you know, it's like, like an orientation, it's sharp, these things. But you combine them and then it starts learning stuff like eyes, uh, this is a mouth probably, a nose, you know? And then you combine this even more and you start understanding more complex concepts like, like a face, right? Or like another object. So, yeah. So that's, that's why these things are so successful, because like, like what we do, they start with something simple and they combine it to learn something very complicated. Um, okay, so now I want to give another motivating example. Um, this is, um, th there is a project of uh, Mike, who is sitting there, and what he wants to do, he wants to measure uh, atmospheric pollution in Kampala, in Uganda. Um, here I should say credits to Mike, because now people think this is Mike. This is not Mike, Mike is the guy who took the picture. <laughs> um, so you, you want to measure atmospheric pollution, okay? And um, you have some sensors, and the sensors measure something, okay? And um, when, when, let's say you have some data from, from the past week, because Mike went to Uganda and he collected some data, and we have some data about the levels of pollution for the past seven days up, up to yesterday. And then Mike gets some new data for today. And let's say this data is something like, um, uh, some, what do you measure actually? I don't know, you measure concentration of CO2 or something? I don't know. Well, this is a, it's, so they call it PM2.5. Okay. It's, it's, 
it's some particles, but you will learn about that tomorrow. Okay, it's some particles, right? But this is something that is it's not very reliable. You are not sure that from these particles you can predict very well the pollution. So what is a clever thing to do? A clever thing to do is to predict the pollution tomorrow, but also take into account what was the pollution yesterday, right? And what was the pollution the day before? Because what you expect is something like this, right? So, so let's say this is the particles, whatever, that... Um, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's correct. Uh, this is like the time of the day and uh, the particles. And let's say you measure something like that, and then you want to predict the pollution, right? Wh how, where this is going. And the thing is that, well, I want to draw this. If this is time, knowing the time information is very important because if you, ha if you have this part of the function and you want to predict in the future, which is here, then you know that you are going to be somewhere around this area, right? Unless something crazy happens, and the pollution jumps here, right? So you want to take into account the previous measurements to make a better prediction. And this gives rise to another model, which is again a neural network, but it's called a recurrent neural network. Which again, as I explained in the very beginning, is just combining things that we already saw, like the basic thing that we saw in the notebook, to, to make the recurrent neural network. So it looks like this. Uh, well, you get the inputs, you put it through the neural network, now make it look like a box, right? I just abstract it, and you get the outputs, right? So you measure inputs, you pass it through the black box, and you get the outputs. And now the novel thing is that you get this, this recurrency here. Well, the recurrency basically, if, if, if you like unroll it, it looks like that. So basically what you do is that, very, in the very high level, you can think of it as fitting a neural network for time zero, and then for time one, instead of fitting it from the beginning, you also try to remember what was the neural network doing in the previous time step, right? So you create something temporal. Is that clear? Yeah? Good. Uh, so you create like something temporal, and this allows you to take into account past, past knowledge. And uh, yeah, this is a recurrent neural network that I'm sure you have heard of. And this is what people use in speech, for example, because speech is sequential and in many other applications in, in text. Um, good. Um, yeah, question. Okay, so yeah, the, the question is what the layers are connected here. So I, um, I read um, a book that's about, part of it about recurrent neural networks and they have this recurrent neural network zoo. And basic people have suggested all the possible combinations you can imagine. You can, you can take this layer to that layer, or you can skip one layer. So basically once you start playing with these things, you can just rewire things and, and get new things. So I don't know, you can take an input from here to here, and inside here, you can try different combinations. People really do. Sorry? If you do a new one, you publish it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm being recorded, so I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> he said, yeah, you, pub you, you do a new one, you publish a paper, right? I mean, if it's a good one, I guess. But, but yeah, people have tried all sorts of stuff. And the, but that, that's another part of deep learning, though. It's because you can really try these things easily. Um, OK. So let me switch a little bit now. I, and now I want to go back to what Ralph was saying in the morning, need for uncertainty and need for probability. So, so far we saw predictions, right? We want to classify zeros and ones. I'm going to not spend much time in that. I'm going to be very brief. But I want to, to highlight one thing. Uh, when you do training with neural networks, neural networks are very good at, at, at learning this function, right? That's getting from input to output. So. If the input is an image, it can tell you very well if it's guacamole or if it's a parrot, right? Or if it's Trump or if it's chicken. Um, but what it cannot tell you very well is how certain it is, right? And we, we, push, we saw the implementation in the Jupyter Notebook. Do you see anything about probabilities? Not really, right? Um, so the neural network will not tell you how uncertain you are, but this is something very important, something that 
you do need to capture because you want to know what you don't know. Okay, uh, it goes back to the to the argument that that has been heard before, a, a lot before. Uh, when you have a self-driving car, you want and you classify if there is a person in front of you. You want to be sure before you take any action about what's happening, right? So if you think that ah oh, no, it's okay, there is no one in front of me, but I'm like not sure, then probably it's better for the car to say okay, you know, driver, please take control, right? So you want this uncertainty, and uh, yeah, and, ah well, I have a sketch here. And um, yeah, there is many other scenarios, right? Like critical predictive systems. Imagine you have, I don't know, a neural network running in a nuclear reactor. You know, if the neural network messes up and it's not sure about the prediction in, in some parameter of, I don't know, the controller of the neural nuclear reactor, you, well, you want to know it, right? Um, and how, how can you get uncertainty? That's, that's a bit... Um, uh, more advanced things, and I'm not going to spend much, much time, but I want to just give you the intuition that one of the things you can do is get from your original neural network. So this is exactly what you have been seeing so far. You have some inputs X, and you have this phi, which is this activation, right? We learned that, we, uh, which gets us inputs this W's, which is the things we optimize. Remember, we found the, the gradients, the derivatives with respect to W. You, you apply that and you find Y, which is the output, right? So that's what we did so far. So what you want to do instead is instead of saying uh, that I have weights W, I want to have a distribution over weights. I want to say, well, you know, maybe this neural network is not trained super well, right? So maybe not what it's predicting is not 100% accurate. And, and why is it accurate? Because maybe the parameter that was 0.23, it should be 0.24 or something, right? So I can never be sure. So what I really want, to be able to, to capture that is to have distributions instead of just parameters. So my weights now are, are not parameters, but they are distributions. Okay? So that's what I want to do. Uh, so that's one of the ways to get a BNN. A BNN is shorthand for Bayesian neural network. And this is something that would be able to give me a, a certain a prediction. It will say, I predict that there is um, you know, a pedestrian in the street and I'm 99% sure about that. So that's very important. Um, and another way you can do it, uh, okay, that's very new things, uh, is that you can have neural net, like when you have a neural network, you have basically a stack of layers, right? That's what you showed. That's one layer, that's another layer. What you can do is that in each layer, you just inject some noise. Some, some distribution, right? So that's another way of doing it. But I'm not going to expand too much about that. And um, yeah, and the last thing I can say is that you can go really funky about these things and just combine it with other models and uh, do many things. So here, for example, I have combined uh, a deep neural network with Gaussian processes. This is what we call a deep Gaussian process. And uh, I'm showing because also Ralph, I think, mentioned it in the morning about Gaussian processes, and you can think of them intuitively just to make the connection as a neural network that has infinite units, in infinite um, uh, activations here, or basis function. Okay? Uh, so that's a connection. Okay, um, so I think I did well with time, right? Uh, I'm going to just give you the conclusions and then answer questions. So, the first conclusion, deep learning is cool and it gives you great power. So, if you feel that you are this little girl with PyTorch probably or MXNet or TensorFlow, all these things, or basically the knowledge of deep learning and powerful machines, what Ralph showed in the, in the morning, you can be uh, this, badass. Um, the next conclusion is that deep learning is not a solution to everything. Uh, sometimes you think about that, it's like, okay, I have a problem. Oh, yeah, we'll do deep learning. Well, no, we have to think of the constraints, right? Ralph talked in the morning about thinking about your budget, uh, but there's other constraints. Uh, we saw uh, the projects of, um, of John and uh, Ernest here, right? You want to do classification and you want part of that to run on a mobile phone. So you can say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, we'll put like 100 layers and we'll let it learn. Well, that's not going to work, right? Um, 
So it's not a solution to everything. It has many problems like all the methods. Okay, it's just it happens to be very popular right now and there is many success stories, obviously. That's coming back to the question, don't conflate deep learning with machine learning because this makes us sad. Um, that's my impression of what a data scientist looks like, but I don't know. <laughs> I literally searched for s sad, sad nerd or something like that, I think on Google. Um, yeah, but, but this, this, is, this is important. Um, this, these things are not the same. Uh, machine learning is something general, is making machines learn, and uh, the, there is an evolution of, of ways to do that. Uh, in the heart of that is probabilistic modeling, um, but there is, you know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, different models, different theories, there is even research about um, how you can do inference in non-Euclidean spaces, so you subtract things in a space that is not Euclidean, all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Um, deep learning is very cool, very powerful, but it's not machine learning. It's a subcategory of machine learning. It's a particular way of doing machine learning, right? Uh, it's a way of doing machine learning when you want to benefit from the very nice concept of going from simplicity to complexity through many layers. And I think, when you think deep learning, you also think neural networks, which is again, this specific thing. It's like parameters multiplied by some input, you get the output, you put in the next layer, and so on, until as many layers you want. And then of course, there is some rewiring that, oh, okay, this layer can be an input to that layer. There is a lot of cool stuff, but it's a particular type of, 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 um, of class of models. Um, so, I assume that many of you are interested and uh, want to learn more about that. My suggestion is that you could start with working on the Jupyter Notebook that we saw today. And uh, I have these instructions in the end of the notebook, which you can download, so you can extend it for arbitrary depth. You can say, okay, what if I don't have one or two layers, which is what we showed? What if I want to have nine or ten layers? So you can write something like a for loop. And the most difficult part will be how to do the training. You need to do this chain rule, right? But you remember these red parts that, that I added, when you added one more layer, you will have more of those. That's, that's it. Um, you can search in the literature and you see what I mean by that, but you can add also a constant term. Uh, instead of having w times x, you also add something. Um, you can play with different parameterizations. So I put the learning rate 0.2, right? And then we saw what happens if you make it very small or very big. So change these things. Think, see how the result is changing. You can even plot, uh, like print the weights, your parameters every time to see what happens. It's, it's going to give you a feeling about how this works. Uh, and then put on the side, forget about that, and it, it implement everything yourselves. Maybe you will find a better way to, to implement it, right? This, and when you do that, it means that you really understood. Um, yeah, and then in the long run, if you want to learn more about deep learning, also always be aware of the, of the caveats. So it's, you know, uh, very powerful stuff, but don't think that you can do everything with that. Uh, and don't think you can do everything without trying to understand even the slide list. Uh, there is tons of online videos and uh, blogs, um, so you can find a lot of resources online um, that simplify and uh, help you understand, but don't oversimplify because, you know, at some point maybe it's going to be more difficult to proceed. And you, I recommend that you learn one of the automatic, uh, of, of, of the frameworks that allow you to um, to apply, to, 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 to create deep learning models and apply them easily. And I think Mustafa is going to take the first step at helping you to do that uh, now. Uh, so that's it. Thanks. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, please. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, di I didn't stress as much about the supervised versus unsupervised. So the convolution um, neural networks is a supervised learning model. And as all of the models that I showed, and as most of the models that you attack with deep learning, um, what you do is that you give a lot of training images, a lot. So if you're going to classify, um, you know, parrots against guacamole, you will give many, many pairs or 
of, of, of images in general, right? And uh, you are going to do generalization, as we discussed before. And uh, this gives me also the opportunity to say that, does it answer the question? Yeah? Yeah, it gives an opportunity to say that one of the caveats that we discuss is that it's very difficult to do unsupervised learning with uh, deep learning because you need to do this chain rule, right? So it needs kind of to have a beginning and an end. So you need to, to it's, 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 it's difficult to apply it if uh, in a supervised way, okay? Because you don't have something to anchor in and do this back propagation. Okay, more questions? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So partially you, partially you answered your second question. So what should I, uh, what technique should I apply again now to, when, in the case where I have a small data set okay. and deep learning? Okay, uh, perfect. Okay, I will take the questions one by one. Um, th I will actually start from the second and the third and then I will go to the first, okay? Um, no, I will, I will go backwards because I think you make, the, you, you make them in the reverse order that, that, than the... Uh, um, so the third question uh, is, um, what happens if you have very few data? Uh, can you still apply deep learning? And, uh, and actually you assume that you cannot. And this is true, uh, that in most cases, um, when you don't have enough data, it's, it's really not impossible, but it's really difficult to make deep learning work. Uh, deep learning is what people say, it's data hungry. So to learn well, you need to have a very powerful machine that is learning for many iterations, as we saw. So I had a super simple example before with four points. It was literally four training points and the output was zero or one and I needed to do something like quite a few steps, right, I iterations. Uh, so it's, it's, it's intensive and also needs a lot of data. And, um, and you cannot always have that. For example, when you want to do image classification, I think probably what most of the people do is that they, they, they have they train neural networks or they take pre-trained neural networks that have been trained on ImageNet, if you have heard it, which is a massive data set from the internet. Uh, it's a really, really huge data set, right? So it works very well, but it's a huge data set. Actually, we had a discussion with Mustafa and, and Ralph over lunch. If this is like, okay, is, if you have so much data, is it like doing some sort of nearest neighbor, right? Um, so what you can use if you have massive data instead of neural networks? Um, well, one thing, just to not be like, ah, you know, don't use them, not, not be uh, judgmental too much. You can be really careful about how you train your neural network, but that's difficult. The other thing is that uh, you can use something that is, has more probabilistic flavor, as you said, or even Bayesian flavor. So the Bayesian flavor allows you to give prior, prior distributions to your parameters. Um, you can think of, it, of this as penalty instead of saying, okay, you know, you optimize the weights and the weights can take any possible value, right? If you have few data and you have so many possibilities of tuning this massive network, then it's very difficult to train it. But if you take prior distributions, it's like saying my preference is for the weights to be close to zero or something, right? Um, so if you, if you have these Bayesian models, then you reduce, you, you say what's your preference when you don't have enough data. And uh, probably state-of-the-art methods that do that is, uh, I would say, Gaussian processes, um, which can really be trained with very few data. Uh, obviously, also linear models um, and Bayesian neural networks. There is, there is many other stuff, right? Um, so your second question was, what are the general disadvantages of neural networks? One uh, of deep neural networks, one is that they cannot work if you don't have enough data, which is exactly what we discussed. The other is that it's very difficult to find um, 
um, what I want to say, to find the certainty, to find how, how certain you are about the predictions. So you, yeah, fair enough, you can, you can find if there is a human in front of you or not, uh, if, if, if you are a self-driving car, but it's difficult to know how, how certain you are about that. Um, other things is that uh, it's difficult to do unsupervised learning, so you need to give training examples. You cannot say, well, you know, here is a scene, learn from that, right? Um, I don't know, what else? Um, there's a lot of stuff, but now not many come to my mind. Maybe you can, you can uh, add more later on. Um, yeah, and the first question was that you have heard about some very state-of-the-art things like autoencoders and uh, general adversarial networks. I'm not going to discuss too much about this because they are quite advanced things and maybe be, not everyone is going to be interested. But since you ask, I can tell you very quickly uh, that the general ad generative adversarial networks are uh, a way of taking neural networks and making them generative models. So they generate things. Uh, so how it works is that uh, you kind of have two competitive networks and uh, one is you can think of it as generating uh, random, random images, let's say, and the other is a classifier that is trying to, um, to decide if the image is uh, in one class or the other. But the, the trick is that the first one is trying to fool the classifier. So now you have two, two systems competing, right? One is trying to fool the other, and this makes both of them better. So that's a very general concept. And uh, autoencoders is again be kind of a kind of Bayesian neural networks the, with the various autoencoders. I assume you mean. And um, I, actually, it's it's very it's, it's it's something very close to that. Okay, just just to summarize. Okay, other questions? Yes. In your experience, how do you select the active? Ah, okay. Yeah, that's a very good question as well and uh, also something that I should have mentioned. So the question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the question is how you select the architecture. So I was talking about this kind of, well, this kind of things, right? Or this kind of things. And, and yeah, this begs the question, but how do you come up with that in the first place, right? How do you connect this? Um, and it's good that you ask in my experience because a large part of that is based on experience. Unfortunately, another kind of disadvantage of neural networks. Some people accuse them that they are not like maybe grounded in a part of them in a very principled, um, you know, in a framework. Uh, meaning that uh, it, it allows for a lot of a lot of intuition, right? Which which is a good and a bad thing. Uh, so to, to, to make things like that, you need to do a lot of experimentation. You need to acquire a lot of intuition. Nowadays, there is something called AutoML, where people try to somehow automate these things. Um, but in my opinion, it's still relatively brute force. So um, you can imagine having like some model that is trying to generate these models, and then you test it, you do benchmarks automatically, you see what works well. But it's, it's I don't know if Mustafa has another idea, but I think it's kind of a, a little bit dirty procedure. It's a bit of trial and error. You read papers, you see what worked, and that's it. But yeah, so that's, that's why these things have, have names, right? This is Inception vers version three, right? So once you make it, it's like, boom, it's that. Version two is different, you know, it's last year. And, you know, I don't know, maybe version two um, doesn't have this or something, right? What's that? There are two other versions even after this. Year. Really? That's a long one? Oh, no. <laughs> there is even better than this one. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a bit of a painful procedure. And that's, that's again coming to the disadvantages, right? If you have a fully Bayesian, fully probabilistic model, once you write down what you want to do, then you know exactly what are your assumptions, you know exactly what, are, what is the power, the limitations, what are the boundaries of how, where all the parameters go. But you have other problems in that case. Okay? Other questions? Yes. Uh, so the question is if there is other methods that are deep learning but are not deep neural networks. And 
again, I guess this is semantics. Um, so, for example, this kind of thing that I was showing, that's actually coming from uh, my own research, these deep Gaussian processes. You know, I would say this is deep learning, but it's not a deep neural network in the sense that every layer is not a neural network, but it's a Gaussian process. But it's semantic. Someone would say, yes, but the Gaussian process is a neural network with like infinite units or something, right? Um, if you define a neuron in your own way, and you connect neurons, which you have to, otherwise they don't learn, then you can say, oh, it's a network of neurons, right? Um, yeah, but I think there's a few approaches that are not what most would say are neural networks, and they still agree that it's deep learning. Yeah, there is not something very obvious that comes to my mind, apart from uh, deep Gaussian processes or deep kernel learning um, or these kind of things, because the, the, the classic things like, uh, like deep regression, right? This is a feed-forward neural network. Or a deep logistic regression, that's exactly what we did before. And that's also a neural network, right? That's exactly what we implemented. It doesn't come to my mind something that is like, yeah, I don't know, like, Deep SVM. Maybe people do deep kernels, but but deep kernel machines, yes. But probably this is 0.01 percent of what you find in the literature. Uh, other questions? Okay. Everyone ready for uh, the practical? So now you are uh, you are going to actually become this. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, to, to remove it, yeah. No, I, I was just I was just going to turn off this basically.